All right. Welcome to BasketCon. Um, my name is Peter Kaczynski. I'm IFC on Twitter. I'm known as I Felix. Uh, I do security research and consulting for Red Team Security, and I'm a proud member of Team Nashville. I guess a bit of a sneak peek into what we're going to talk about today is uh, basically how to optimize your password tracking attack using a variety of techniques uh, listed over there. So we'll start and get warmed up a little bit with link and character set analysis and detection and how we can apply that. Then we're going to jump into masks, policy attacks, and my latest research, which just I finished uh, literally uh, a few months ago, is uh, rules of tax and generation. So I guess a little story how I got started with password tracking in the first place. Uh, back in 2010, uh, Core Logic uh, announced the Cracking If You Can competition. And uh, I was playing with password tracking at the time, GPU was just taking off, and uh, the recommended list was, uh, you know what, why don't we take uh, 2,500 passwords from uh, MD5 decryptor CLDK, I believe, and give it a try. So I had a 5970 video card at the time. Uh, it was a, one of the first generation uh, GPU crackers was IG hash GPU by Ivan Milobyov. And you know, I gave it a try. My expectations was you know, 5.6 billion keys per second. I am going to annihilate that stuff. So uh, the reality was a little sad. <laughs> <laughs> I basically spent 24 hours, and after 24 hours, we got 300 passwords. So uh, I went drinking that night, you know, kind of impressed. Woke up the next morning and thought, you know what, password tracking is really an art, and you should approach it in a more intelligent manner. So I guess I started thinking about, well, how are passwords created? What factors? go into the creation of password. So I guess I could identify three classes, uh, psychological, technological, and security. Uh, so to give you an example, a psychological factor. So this guy thinks I like cracking. Okay, so some of your, some of your background, stuff like that. Uh, technological factors are, for example, a lot of systems today, they still require you to come up with eight character passwords. And so that's, a, that's an example. Uh, security factor is, uh, I guess, uh, password policy is a good example. So we require you to create a password, one special character, one digit, one upper, and so on. So once you take all these factors into account, the almost infinite space of passwords that you can come up with becomes all of a sudden severely limited. So in this case, we can predict that chances are this guy over there will come up with a password cracker one or something. And basically, that's the whole idea of my talk, and what I'm trying to uh, build here is smarter password cracking through detection and, uh, and analysis of patterns. And uh, basically, if you can do that, you can significantly reduce the runtime of your attacks, and you can increase the success rate, so you're not going to be a sad panda. So back in 2010, when I, when I was exploring this area, there were no tools that did uh, password analysis on the scale that I needed. So I had to write my own, I called it uh, Password Analysis and Tracking Kit Pack. And it's basically a collection of tools uh, which include uh, rule length and character set analysis, uh, mask analysis, pattern analysis, and the more recent contribution is the ability to automatically detect and generate rules. Uh, this toolkit was built for uh, password tracking competition so less theory and more practical, so it's designed to really for you to get out there, generate some rules, generate some masks, just like uh, Shens was talking about, and, and go crack it. And at the time, I was also introduced to the amazing collection of tools uh, from, from Hashcap, and that really allowed me to really explore different uh, password cracking techniques. The latest copy of Pack will always be available on my website, scroll.org. And if you want to play around with the latest developments, there's a GitHub. Uh, the current version is pretty functional right now. I just need to write the documentation properly to make a release. So you can start writing. Right. All right. So in order to prepare for the competition, I really needed a nice sample of passwords to analyze. So at the time, back in 2010, the best sample, and probably still is, is Rocky, because they lead to 14 million passwords in clear text. So 100% cracked, obviously, it's in clear text. There's nothing to crack. So there's no uh, 
there's no bias introduced there for by someone who was attacking those vessels. So for example, if you take something like uh, Gamago, which just happened pretty much a year ago, six million uh, passports were, uh, were compromised, but that constitutes only 90% of the total uh, leak. So, a very important warning, all of the statistics that I'm going to talk about are relative to the number of leak, uh, actually cracked passwords. So, if I say 100% of PHPBB passwords can be cracked this way, what I really mean is only 97%. So, be mindful of that. So, as far as uh, selecting uh, tools and Hardware, obviously tools I selected OCL Hashcat, and uh, for hardware, I guess the, the de facto uh, GPU card today is uh, 7970. Um, I could have selected faster speeds, you know, 7 to 10 billion, but uh, for all the uh, stats that I'm going to show, I use just 1 billion, so if you have a faster setup, just divide whatever time by a factor of how many video cards you have. So, if you're like Jeremy, you have 100 billion, keys per second setup, just divide it, whatever numbers they give you, go by 100. All right, so let's get warmed up a little bit with password analysis and start with uh, password length. So a little bit of audience participation. Can you yell out uh, what is the average uh, length of passwords that you think is out there? 12 inches. Eight. <laughs> eight. <laughs> That's an no. Zero. Eight. All right, I, I'm, I'm hearing eight. All right, there's hope. <laughs> So the first tool that I wrote is called StatsGen, and the way it works is basically you provide it a list of words, cracked words, and it will generate a bunch of different statistics. Uh, one of the stats is basically based on link, password length. So you see that for RawQ, at least, 20% of passwords were eight characters at once. Whoever yelled out, they do job. And then after that, it's closely followed by seven, nine, and so on. So performing the same analysis on a bunch of other leaked lists, so eHarmony, Gamago, and so on, you see clear pattern. The majority, it's almost like a bell curve. There's a majority of uh, passwords being somewhere in the eight character range, uh, with a few exceptions like um, Gamago, you see that's 44% gray, so that's in, in uh, 10 character length. So this will come into play later on as we get into more advanced attack. If you don't mind, I have a lot of questions. I, I will have time at the end, definitely. Um, so immediately you can, you can take this basic information and adjust your password cracking a little bit. So if you cover one to eight characters, brute force, you'll get maybe 50, 60%. If you go up to 10, maybe you'll get 80 or so. But this is just the beginning. All right. So now let's get into the next level, which is also warming up. So password character sets. So we're talking about lower alphanumeric, alphanumeric, mixed, and so on and so on. So what do you guys think is the most common character set used by a password out there? Lower. 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 Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so same thing with stats gen. Another part of stats that you can generate is basically which character set. So again, you can see for Rock here, the majority was lower alpha numeric. So lower alpha, lower alpha numeric is probably a good target. So once again, I applied it to a whole bunch of different loop lists. And you can see clear patterns on the very left where lower alpha is pretty much dominated by the majority of them, with a few exceptions. Uh, you can see the really deep blue color is LinkedIn. Uh, sorry, uh, Stratford. Stratford is, has uh, quite a few mixed alpha numeric passwords. And uh, eHarmony has about 60% and mostly upper alpha. <laughs> So this will come in handy soon. So yeah, the majority is low alpha. So basically the idea here is, let's say you analyze Rocky list, you found patterns in the Rocky, let's apply them to the rest. So the recent compromise in Docker, so if you did what I did at first, the really naive way of just brute forcing it, thinking that your amazing video card setup will just take care of it, it'll take 76 days. If you approach it a little bit smarter, then you can reduce that time to 47 minutes and still cover, I guess, 90%. So that's the idea of pattern detection, analysis, and going back and forward, back and forward. 
Uh, at the same time, you can, with Statian, you can perform filters just to see how well your coverage works. So you can say maximum length of eight characters, define the character set that you want to use, and it will basically say, okay, so for Gawker, given that character set, your coverage is 90%, and it will give you corresponding stats for, for that uh, filter. So same thing, I applied it to all the different leaks, and notice how eHarmony is, is a complete disaster. So I <laughs> more than one. <laughs> yeah. So, and the idea really is, it, the whole point of PAC is that you, it's all about pattern detection. So the way you should be using this tool is you should run a little bit of brute force, collect your sample. So in this case, I just brute force everything up to six characters. Immediately, you're going to see, okay, so there's an obvious pattern where it uses upper alphanumeric. So use that, reapply it, and now once again you can create more optimal attack. Alright, so that was a warm up. So hopefully, you're in this mindset of analyzing and detecting patterns and all that good stuff. So now let's get into fun uh, mask analysis. Uh, so for a mask, I think uh, Jens would already talked a little bit about it, but I guess we'll just cover it again. But uh, so given a, a string, password, one exclamation mark, you can subdivide it per position and say which character set is at what position. So the first one is U, which is uppercase. And this is using hashtag syntax, by the way. So L is lowercase. Uh, at the very end, you have D, which is digit, so it corresponds to number one. Exclamation mark is S. So you, you start building up those masks. So again, what do you think is the most common mask out there that you've encountered in your password tracking? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see in a second. No worries. All right. So my first attempt at mask analysis and disastrous one. I'll explain in a second was to simply take, uh, I guess, 14 million passwords, convert them to masks, and just say what is the most occurring one, and display your list. So in this case, for Rocky, the most common mask is, I guess, eight characters, all lower, uh, lower digits. The coverage is 4%. So I did a similar thing. I guess my goal was to come up with this golden collection of those perfect masks that you can apply to any password list and track most of them. So there's no such thing. I failed. You can see that the best you can do is 25% with uh, Gawker. But for the majority of them, it's like 10% or so. So we need a better approach, though. Thinking a little bit more about what masks are and what information it holds, we can, we can tell some interesting facts. So based on a mask, we can say how long it is. So in this case, it's eight characters. Based on analysis of the leaked list, we can say how many times it occurs. So for Rocky, it occurred 70,000 times. At the same time, given that we know character set per position, we can calculate its complexity or key space. And at the same time, so we can estimate how long it's going to uh, take to run if we just take, again, 1 billion keys per second uh, benchmark. At that point, I wrote a different tool called MaskGen. Uh, and all it is is a sorting tool. Uh, the way it works is you tell it which algorithm you want to sort by. And opt-index, not to sound too fancy, but all it is for now is just a ratio of complexity versus occurrence. Um, at the same time, if you are in an engagement with your pen tester, you probably don't have 30 days to perform your attack, so you can specify how many seconds the maximum runtime is. So in this case, uh, I guess for just a day, which is nice for a competition or a pen test, we, uh, you can specify that. So basically, as it's generating masks, it will continue aggregating how long those masks are going to take to run and stop at a predefined point. And uh, here's some interesting masks that we've generated. So notice the very first highlighted one. So even though its coverage is only 159 keys, passwords, because it's executing only 39 seconds, that mask will be given higher priority as opposed to a mask which, is, which has higher coverage, but at the same time takes the whole two minutes to run. At the same time, the, the third highlighted mask over there, while it only executes in two seconds, because its coverage is so low, it will be rated lower because, uh, 
compared to other masks. So it's a nice way to sort masks based on their efficiency, not just complexity or appearance. Uh, and at the same time, at the very bottom, you'll see that the masks that you generated, you generated 5,000 or so masks, they have coverage of 75%, which is nice. Of, so if you took those masks and attacked Roculus, and the total runtime, just as we, we asked it to, is one day. So this graph represents basically different sorting and their different sorting algorithms and how efficient they are. So on the very left, you see my first and failed attempt to be the occurrence. So that one has maybe 10, 20% coverage and average. So not very useful for us. On the right side, I also implemented complexity sorting. So you know what, just get the fastest mass first and, and let them rip. So their coverage is 40%. The golden middle, as always, is the opt index, which has excellent coverage and improves significantly more as you, uh, if you have a faster setup. Uh, you can see you can get maybe 60 or so, 60, 70% on average. At the same time, uh, the, the sheer number of masks generated, you can see with complexity, because I'm trying to squeeze in as many possible fast masks as possible, there'll be somewhere in the range of 16,000 masks. So I'm not sure even Adam can implement a sufficiently fast engine to go through all these. Uh, occurrence, you basically generate one or two masks and then you're done. You just exhausted all your time that you have allocated. So again, gold mill, gold mill is off index and uh, it's very successful. So applying it to the actual password list, so I generated masks for just one day using Rocky List as a sample and applied it to a whole bunch of different leaks. So, the blue line in the way represents the, the, the mass generated by Rock U, and the red line represents the most optimal mass attack that you can perform against those leaks. So in case of LinkedIn, it's almost perfect. Within five days, you get uh, like a 70% or more. Uh, yeah, we go. Uh, you see there's a big jump there, and remember when we were analyzing Gamigo, the majority of passwords were in the 10 character range, while Rock U was uh, more dominated by eight characters. So it does catch up eventually. Actually, if you give it another couple of days, it will, the graph will come together. But it, because it's first trying all the eight character maps, that's why there is a gap. Um, PHPDD is perfect. eHarmony, even though it's using completely different character set, we're, we're still having no problems using uh, opt-index sorting. And there's the first stickler, Stratford. So the most optimal mask says that you can uh, mass attack says that you can crack all of them uh, within five or I guess five or so days. Now at the same time, if you apply rock you, it's actually doing pretty bad. So before I explain why that's happening and how we're going to attack this this type of uh, password collections, let me talk about uh, password policy attacks against password policies and mass analysis. So there are a few interesting publications on uh, how to define uh, strong password policies. Can you guys know the nicknames for these books? Yellow Mouth? Rainbow. 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 Okay, so what, are, what is the first one? The OP Trusted Computer Evaluation. Do you know the colors? Something the Green Book. What's that? The Green Book, yes, I'm saying. Oh, you got the trick question. So the Blue Book is actually called the Green Book because I don't know why the OP calls Blue Green. Who knows? Um, <laughs> so let's let's think of a typical password policy. Uh, you're told you must stick a password which is eight characters long, at least one lower digit, at least one upper, at least one digit, at least one special. So we consider the entire character space generated by for all all the compliant passwords and divide it into what what is compliant and what is not compliant. We'll see that 62% of passwords. <laughs> are non-compliant and 38% are non-compliant. So if you know that the target is using policies, then you should really concentrate on only compliant passwords. Why waste your time on something that would never be in the list in the first place? The way this translates into time, you go from 76 days, which is pure brute force, to just 35 days. And again, one billion, so if you have a faster setup, it will be like three days and, or three minutes, whatever. Uh, so it takes a lot less time actually to go as larger coverage 
Because compliant passwords don't have uh, really expensive masks like uh, old special characters, which take forever to hit. So basically, I wrote a tool called PolicyGen, which provided with a password policy, so minimum digits, and so on and so on, it will generate a collection of password compliant policy masks, which you can plug into the OCL hashtag, and you will attack just, just the passwords which have some potential to be in the set. And you can see that uh, on the very bottom, I generate 40,000 masks, and it will take you 35 days to run. So if you are, if you are uh, a defender or someone who creates policy, you should really not estimate your policy based on the worst case scenario, which is full brute force. As a rule of thumb, you should probably take the half of that. That would be a little more realistic. At the same time, if you are an auditor or a pen tester, you probably not have to, you know, to crack all compliant passwords, because that's not going to show anything to them. They'll probably say, find the old and non-compliant passwords. So what you can do is you can include the dash dash non-compliant flag. It will generate specifically non-compliant password masks for you. You can plug it into OCL Hashcat and you can find to whoever picked that password. And again, it takes uh, 41 days with 24,000 masks. So with that, let's get back to Stratford. So we had, we had a little issue with Stratford where we saw that our optimal attack was not very efficient. So what I did was I ran a hash in a full brute force mode for an hour or so, just to collect a sample. Well, full, it would take 46 days if you wanted to exhaust it. But. And then using StatsGen, I analyzed results. And immediately as you look at passwords, you'll see that uh, this alphanumeric password appears to be completely randomly generated, which is a perfectly good indication of a policy. What I did next was I generated a collection of uh, compliant policies, policy maps, and applied it. So lots of lines here. So let's, let's watch. Stratford up index. So red line over there represents the most perfect mask attack that you can perform. Yellow line, uh, sorry, green line represents the policy that we generate. So you see that it's not perfect, but it follows almost precisely how you would attack it if you customize the attack just with Stratford. Uh, blue is our original Rocky who failed attack. But here's an interesting thing. The Rocky list sorted by complexity is actually going pretty good against policy attacks. So you should, uh, I think all of these mask uh, sets will be provided in the next release of Hashcat, so you will be able to play with them. All right, so Master Gut. The next really fun attack that you can do is rules, word mangling rules analysis. So originally, I started working on this back in 2012, but I think I had messaged Jen saying, it's like, hey, we'll be done in two weeks. So a year later, I can finally present you something, <laughs> something more or less useful. And it's a pretty fascinating, uh, I had a lot of fun with this research. So again, let's look at sample mangled up password. So it looks pretty pretty crazy. So who can tell me what is the original source dictionary word used to create this? Password. password. <laughs> All right. Now who can tell me every single rule used to convert password into this guy? Toggling tables, um, uh, pending numbers. Okay. Searching a letter. All right, yes. A, that's right. <laughs> Now do that 14 million times. <laughs> so yeah, you got most of them, you know, there's substitution, there's replacement, there's uh, deletions, and the source for is password. So as human beings, we're pretty good at detecting patterns like this. But obviously, I really wanted to automate this to, to make it run at scale. And given a password such as this one, if I can break it up into two sets of all the possible source words that could have been used to create it, and a separate set of all the possible rules which could, use, could be used to mangle it up and create, it, create those passwords. What I can do with those is, we know that people repeat themselves, so they will repeat those source words and rules. So you can smash them together, remix them together. Uh, you can apply generated source word against other rules and uh, similarly generated rules against other words. So, uh-huh. So the next tool that I wrote was called RuleGen. So you can see here's a pattern with those names. Um, 
and I basically broke down the, the problem into three parts. Uh, first, I needed to figure out how to come up with a collection of reasonable source words for any given password. Then I converted them into Levenstein rules, and I'll explain how, what, what exactly that is. And then last, I, again, I'm trying to compete on um, tracking if you can and win. So I really needed to convert them into practical hash rules, which I can use on the competition and profit. So source words, uh, the way I approach this problem is just by asking a bunch of questions. So the first one was, well, I'm not going to target randomly generated numbers uh, and passwords. Uh, I'm really targeting mangled up diction words. So if you consider that mangled up diction words is a case of intentional misspelling. Okay? The assumption falls apart quickly, but for the meantime, you can see that if I just put in P4S word 1 into the standard spell checker, I can actually uh, reverse the source word. So for more complex passwords, that all the spell checker gets confused. Whoa, I have no idea what's going on there. So the way I approach this problem is by introducing a pre-analysis engine, which basically attempts to detect uh, uh, several rules which are hard for spell checkers to detect in the first place. And those rules will be something like rotation, reversal, uh, prefix, appendix, duplication, so uh, combinations, so Superman, and as well as patterns. So if I see a pattern which corresponds to Gmail, why should I provide a password tracker, uh, sorry, a spell checker with the full string when I can just give them something a little bit more cleaned up? Um, at the same time, the effectiveness of spell checkers is highly dependent on the types of word list that they use. So another feature that I implemented was the ability to use custom dictionaries for rule generation. So that improves uh, your rule generation, but at a cost of performance. Um, so whichever you whole bunch of words, how, how are we going to judge which one is a good one, which one is a bad one? So a really amazing algorithm is Levenstein at any distance. You can read more about it on Wikipedia. But it basically tells you the optimal edit distance, the, the optimal edit operation count that you need to perform to transform one word into another. So in the case of password, you can see that the source word password, so P4S word, the, the source word password has edit distance of two, which should make sense because it does two substitutions. And the lower two candidates will be thrown out, Pisaro assured, uh, because their edit distance is too high. Um, the next stage, okay, so now I have a whole, I have a dozen or so source words. Now I need to figure out how the hell do I, what rules do I need to implement to, uh, to transform source word into password. So I'm not going to worry with this math, but it's a, it's a pretty awesome algorithm. So even if all this research is, is garbage, you at least come, come out today knowing the Levenstein algorithm. So the way it works is uh, you can basically create a matrix with a source or target word. Uh, on the vertical line and again the target board on, on the horizontal line or vice versa, it doesn't matter. And the way you populate it is uh, consider on the left side this blank cell represents just a blank string. So the edit distance between a blank cell and letter P is one. So one insertion of one character. At letter A you have edit distance two because you insert it two characters. B, A and so on and so on and so on until you get to D, which represents to transform a blank string into the string password, you need to perform eight insertions. So you can continue in the same, in the same logic. Uh, so for letter B, notice the diagonal line represents the distance between, uh, between letter, the two letters P at distance is zero. So which makes sense because there are no edit operations required. And at the same time, between letter P and A, just one, one insertion, you can see the pattern. Now here's the first challenge. So what if the two strings that we're comparing, there's a, there's the letters don't match. So according to Levenstein algorithm, you just look at uh, the least costly neighbor, so left, top, diagonal, and you increment it by one. So in this case, we just added one. And what this translates to is basically what's called the Levenstein matrix. And on the very bottom right corner, you're going to get your most optimal uh, edit, edit distance, which is, uh, which is 2. And indeed, 
the elements between P4, SS, W, 0, RD is two substitution operations. Neat. So when I was playing with this algorithm, I thought, well, well, hey, if I can walk it all the way to the bottom, I can generate this matrix. If I walk back in reverse and trace all the optimal paths to get from one order to another, I can actually come up with, uh, I guess, what's called Levenstein rules. So I did all the algorithm, uh, which is recursive, depth first, short circuited algorithm for your comp side out there. And it's very simple. It, you just basically wiggle your way through from the bottom right corner all the way to the top left. And if you have to move up, you just have an insertion. If you have to move left, you just delete it here. You have to move diagonally and the cost did not change, then there's no change. The two strings are equal. If there is a change, then you have simply substitution. So easy peasy. Taking the first step. So based on the matrix that we generated before, so which which is the most optimal path? Which rule would you recommend? So there's the, the options are up, left, or diagonal. Diagonal. Yeah. Did the cost change? No, that means there's no uh, the two strings are equal. There's no operation. Next one, uh, look at the position where the letter O and zero intersects. So, what is the most optimal path again? Diagonal. But because the cost change, according to our algorithm, we got a substitution. So we got our first rule. And what you do is. You continue in this manner until you find the optimal path back to the very top corner and you record all the rules. Uh, at the same time, there may be multiple uh, different pathways that you can take. So you should really implement the uh, optimizations for it. Um, so look at where the blue circle is. So over there you can take a diagonal path or you can take go to the left. So uh, in this case, I went diagonally and it performed the delete A substitute, sub, substitution operation and deletion operation. But there's another rule that which you could have generated, which involves deleting an S and then substituting the first S to an A. So what this really shows is that it's nice that we can, you know, if we look at the password for a while, we'll probably figure it out eventually. But doing it on a large scale against 14 or so million passwords, you really need some kind of mechanism like this one. So in this case, you see on the very bottom of the tree, you have a vertical movement, so that's insertion. Uh, for a horizontal movement at the intersection, you see where the two ones are with purple, that's deletion. So, cool stuff. So that's basically how the algorithm works. And now that you have a collection of these hash rules, uh, what you can do is you can convert them into I guess the most simple operations possible. So basically all we have is insertion, deletion, substitution. So the most primitive hash cap rules that you can generate is the D, which shows just an index of when you want to delete all. Again, index based replacement, and I, insertion. So, but of course, why stop there? Because if we really consider all the rules which are out there, based on just these three classes of rules, we can generate all sorts of different stuff. So if we approach it a little a bit more cleverly, we can say, okay, so if the letter that we just inserted is at the very end, then we can use hash capital to a dollar sign. If you replace one letter to another and it's an ASCII increment, then there's a hash capital for that. So I think we went through every single rule that hash got implemented and implemented all these rules to create something like this. So if we look back to our previous example, delete A will use the same. Substitution, what I do is I guess, uh, okay, so O, letter O disappeared, and zeros appeared, and there are no other O's left, so I can do a global substitution. Uh, insert one, insertion was done uh, at the very end, so dollar sign one. So it's not a really trivial problem uh, because Especially when you do global substitutions, uh, you have a holding problem basically. What if there's a, you substitute all the S's, but then at the end you decided to insert another S? So there's a, a bit of a boost force and elements of S and T solver involved there, so I have to re implement the whole Hashcat uh, rules engine in Python. 
That's why. <laughs> so, and this is the result, basically. So, the rule gen, that's the, the rule generator, it operates in two modes. So, for just a little bit of fun, you can just say dash dash password, and you can provide it a really mangled up password, and it will attempt to reverse it. So, in this case, you can see that it correctly resolved uh, source word to password. And for singular word password, it came up with an optimal rule. So, delete first, substitute all instances of S to dollar sign, same with the O to zero, so that's elements of lead speed. And then we have this A insertion and uh, pending one, two, three. So, and all is done automatically. At the same time, for plural passwords, we actually pick three different possible ways that you can, that you can go from one to another. So that's also interesting. At first I was trying to come up with this best possible rule for all of them. But in the end I gave up and just started generating as many of those as possible. And then if, you know, if I'll put it into some kind of statistical analysis, just like I did with MassGen, the good rules will come out. So, Again, so you can take a whole list like Docker and you can, you can feed it to Google Gen and eventually, so this, this is pretty slow, uh, but actually the latest release of Google Gen finally implements multi-processing, so it's actually more or less usable on competition or pen tests so you can perform uh, recycling attacks that I'll show you in a second. Um, but uh, you can basically see that it starts generating and it shows you some of the top rules that are generated. So reverse all, appending one, flip the case of the first uh, first character. That colon over there means uh, no change. So basically, uh, rule gen ran the password. It was found in the dictionary, so why bother getting any rules for it? So it'd be done. So I took a bunch of leaf lists and ran against all of them. And so for Rocky, you can see uh, Source words are lover, baby, lovey, Maria, Jean loves, love. You see, you see, back, keep up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for LinkedIn, you know, there's a job, link, LinkedIn, password, Alex, Mike. Now, if you look at top words, that was that was uh, that was a little disappointing because dollar sign one, dollar sign two, that's all just pending stuff. So. Just spending all this time implementing ASCII increments and cutting rules and bit shifting, basically that was a waste. Well, I guess kind of wasted effort. So maybe there's hope. Uh, let's see, singles.org compromise. Jesus love angel love me faith. All right, there is no hope. <laughs> all right, but as a side effect, while I was doing all of this, I did generate. So for Rocky, at least, I generated 67 million unique rules. And I sorted them based on their occurrence. So I guess I'm not going to run all of them. So I took the top 1 million and basically put them against the, I guess, the trial against the existing rules that are in Hashcat right now. And I guess the, the target I chose was Gamigo. Just, it was a fast hash and device, so it was a good way to test your waters. And you can see that um, the, the Rocky 1 million is actually doing pretty good. It, the, the advantage of it is that you usually run out of rules to run, so you have nothing, you're done. So you run, run your rule and you're done. So what, do you, what else are you going to do? Where Rocky 1 million just keeps that like address by it, keeps on going and going. Yeah. The, the, list are, the efficiency of rules are highly dependent on the word list they use. Where before I used example dict from uh, OCL hashtag distribution. If you use something like a Wikipedia dictionary, that one's uh, rule list actually needs the crap out of uh, one million bucks, so good job on that one. But you really are missing the point if you apply rules like that. The whole point of back and rule gen and all of these is that it's, it's all about recycling. So you crack a little bit of passwords, you rerun rule gen, and then you throw them back into hashcat and crack, crack some more. And to illustrate this, so you can see the blue line is my initial trial. After I cracked all these passwords, I took them, put them back into rule gen, <coughs> and then we uh, generated a little more rules, a little more source words, and boom, all of a sudden, cracked another million passwords. So that's that's the power of it. And the idea of back really is it's all about this, this cyclical recycling, rinse, repeat. Crack some passwords, analyze them, generate masks, 
generate rules. Again, repeat, repeat over and over again. So don't go as crazy as this guy, you'll go bold. But the idea is there, lateral rinse, repeat. That's, that's the most efficient uh, attack. Um, I guess the takeaways that you can do from this talk is if you are a de uh, developer or a defender, hopefully you've seen some attacks out there so you'll be able to predict what risk you're facing and what you need to defend against in the future. If you're a penetration tester or attacker, hopefully you learn some interesting ways to be more efficient and more successful. So again, so you can illustrate uh, better risk to your clients. And if you're a security researcher, hopefully you've seen the, all the amazing things you can do with password cracking and analysis. And, and there is a lot more talks coming up uh, in this conference, so maybe you'll be inspired to contribute and grow in this area. It's just really vast field. Uh, definitely, none of this would be possible. The tool is built on, on, on the backs of giants, so there's <coughs> decades of research into password cracking from the original crack and to John the Ripper to uh, Hashcat, but special thanks to Jens and Team Hashcat because their encouragement in, for me to continue working on this tool. If it wasn't for the Crack Me If You Can competition, really I wouldn't get into uh, password cracking at all, so uh, thanks, thank you very much guys. And de definitely thank you to Pierre and Jeremy for organizing this conference and getting the word out. So.